Reclaimed Heirloom. My name is Christina and this is Chalk Paint 101 Q&A Episode 3. So this is a Q&A questions and answers, a series that I've started and this is to help anybody who is subscribing to my channel that is creating decorative finishes with chalk paint may need a little troubleshoot in understanding a few of the technical and a technical support. So I've added this series in to help you be most successful with your projects. So I have some amazing questions and let's get started. My first question is blending paint versus painting layers. There is a distinction between the two. And the best way I can break this down is when I'm blending with paint, I'm actually wanting my base coat to make new colors with the new paint I'm putting on. So I'm blending. So if I'm starting, just to keep it really simple, say I have a base coat of white, now I'm gonna add in, say, a green. I want the variances of the white and the green to now bring out new colors. So I'm blending, I'm blending with the paints. So the key in this question is, do I wait for my base coat to dry? No, you don't need to do that because you're gonna be misting and adding water with a spray water bottle or a mist uh, water bottle as you're creating. Where the other way, and this is where it gets a little confusing for people, is layering paints. So this is when it kind of goes into the, some of the faux finishes I've demonstrated in my videos. When I'm layering and creating, say, the ragging technique or I'm using a sponge, etc., etc., I don't want my base coat to be reactivated. So this is where it's really important to make sure that that base coat is 100% dry. So when I go and add this paint wash and a moist rag and I'm ragging in a new texture, I'm adding in a new layer with a new color tone, I want that base coat to, you can see it underneath it, but I don't want it to activate new colors. So I hope that all makes sense. So think of blending paints, no need to wait for your base coat to dry because you want to make more colors. Where I'm layering into a color, I kind of want that base coat not to activate new colors. So I hope that makes sense. Our next question. What is the difference between salt wash and fresco. So these are two working mediums that I've been using quite a bit of um, in a lot of my newer tutorials. And this is great because I'm going to be introducing a few more mediums to you um, in some upcoming videos and I'm super excited about that. But salt wash is a textured medium, obviously having salt in it. Fresco is a textured medium. It doesn't have salt in it. So the difference between the two is because this has salt, it's just more granular. And it just, the, the texture is a little bit different because of it's almost, uh, it's, it's almost got a stipple in itself with the salt. Whereas with Fresco, it does not. So the Fresco, I'm trying to do this so the light doesn't glare on that. So the Fresco is just adding a really, really thick texture. And this is really going to enhance the paint to create um, a beautiful texture. And it's going to give you a lot of, um, how can I describe this? It's almost like a stucco in a, in a way. So you've got lines and you're going to really be able to create a three dimension because of its thickness. Salt wash does that as well, but because of the salt, it adds in that stippled texture 
that I think people have a lot of fun with when you're using two different color tones. So you've started a base color um, with mixing salt wash and a chalk paint 50-50. Now you're gonna put on just a new color right on top of it once that's completely dry. If you're wanting to knock it back a little bit and you're just wanting to do little tiny points to that, I would say that that's the advantage point to salt wash. Again, both of these are fantastic, but this is just gonna give you that little bit more granulation. So if you're just looking for subtleties and you wanna have that little bit of control, this is gonna help you um, a little bit easier than this. This is a beautiful texture. Again, it's it really gives off this amazing high and low point. And um, I'm gonna be actually demonstrating uh, more texture uh, finishes with the fresco and but between the two this has just got the salt granulations to it that's the key to the question in in the difference between the two and I think in the U.S. they have a textured medium that's quite popular with a lot of people too I think they call it sea spray and I'm not sure I've never tried it I can't say in comparison to these two what the differences are. But if there is somebody who has and has used the sea spray quite a bit, please, I'd love your feedback in comparison to say the salt wash or the fresco and how you feel working with that textured medium. So our next question. I actually have a question before we continue on with Q&A for you. I have home renovations that I need to finish and one of the big ones I am absolutely dying to finish and I've got to figure out a way I can implement the time to do so. I kind of want to walk you through my studio which you guys only see a section in my videos and you can see that it's kind of a half finished situation and I really would like to finish it. I am going to redo the walls. I want to redo the cabinets. I actually want to do the countertops and the floors all in my DIY. And I would like to do it using the chalk paints. I want to use a stencil. I actually want to do a faux concrete finish on the countertops. And I want to do all of it as well as protective finish. And I want to share it with you guys. But what I'm asking is, would you guys be interested in video with all of this and everything that I've done and seeing how I'm doing it? And of course, it's going to make the staging of what I do for my Saturday tutorials probably a little nicer to look at than what it is right now. So again, let's go take a look at what it looks like and let me know in the comments below. This is the other side of the studio space that I use for all the filming of my tutorials. And this is an entire guest uh, suite that I have with my house and I've turned this kitchen into my studio. I removed the drop ceiling and put new lights. I have painted it, but as you can see, I'm gonna step in from the other side. I'm not finished. We put in a new ventilation system just because I am using the studio space for painting and some of the supplies that I use, but I want to change the floor. I wanna change the wall colors. I wanna change those cabinet colors. And even through the back way, I even have a spare bathroom and it's a complete bathroom. And I wanted to show that I also like to do a lot of the DIY um, renovation. I'd like to change it. I just need to change the colors and the whole decor scheme of the bathroom as well back here. And you're gonna see what I mean. So I'm gonna be using an epoxy paint for the bathtub. I'm going to change the tiles with a stencil. I'm gonna do all kinds of things. So this is where I thought if I could film and make a couple of tutorials to show you everything that I do, the end, the before and after, if it would be beneficial.
So again, leave me a comment in the comment box below and let me know if you'd like to see uh, video tutorials on how I'm going to change the decor of both that studio slash kitchen as well as this bathroom. I'm just super excited now that we have all brand new windows through the whole house and I just want to get into the decor. Some of you were asking about a tutorial I had done. It's in my playlist um, on my channel about the stencil I did on my deck and how it was holding up and it is still immaculate. After five months, trust me, we all use it. We're all running across it, including two dogs and it works, it's perfect. I haven't had any issues with the chalk paint and the lacquer outdoors. The decoupage versus image transfer is the key to the question. What's the difference? Decoupage versus image transfer. So I think that's where some of the questions and comments um, got a little bit overlapped, if not a little bit confused, and that's okay. So I'm just hoping I can put a little bit of clarity to that. Now I've never done on a video, but I will do, I just haven't done it yet, is an image transfer. So I'm going to take an image that I've printed and now I'm all I want to do is transfer the image directly to my surface. So let it be furniture, canvas, a wood board, doesn't matter. It, an image transfer is what I'm doing is I'm taking the ink of that image and I want it on a new placement but I don't want the paper there. So I'm gonna actually be removing the paper. And there's a, there's a few techniques and it's, it's kind of a patient thing you have to do, but it's, it's beautiful because it really has a, a very painted in look. Um, and again, because I haven't tried it, I was doing what they call a decoupage. And decoupage you can do with a lot of different style papers. And I was just using plain, white paper. So just an 8 by 11 white paper that people use on their printers for printing off documents. And I have a colored printer at home. And it's again, it was 8 by 11. It's just a regular printed image. I save the image on my phone, and then I direct it to print off my printer. And I'm using the Mod Podge glue. I'm putting it on the back, and I'm also putting it on the front and I'm smoothing the image out, which also seals it. So I think where people were getting confused is, is that going to, are you gonna like, is the ink gonna smear? Is it gonna do this? No, no, it didn't do that. All I'm doing is a decoupage and because I'm painting a piece of furniture, I kind of wanna paint it into the piece of furniture. So it's not as noticeable that it's just a piece of paper that has been placed on. And um, it's just creating the illusion of, you know, paper versus not paper and kind of painting it into the decorative finish. So I think people were a little confused that you should be using a, the image transfer. And the image transfer, image transfer is for putting the, the ink of it onto the piece but you're actually taking the paper off as well. Whereas with the decoupage, you're not doing that. You're literally just taking the image and you're, you're mounting it to your piece and then you're gonna seal it. And if you're using the Mod Podge, which is, you know, I think it's pretty broad, it's a glue. You're using a glue for the backside of the decoupage and you're using it for the front to seal it. So I hope that puts a little clarity to it. Um, and I'm gonna get a little bit further into the image transfer, but I have a staples, I have, there are um, like stationary outlets, doesn't matter where you live in the world, that you can go and ask them to print onto a certain type of paper for you know a couple of dollars. You can go and get your image printed there if you don't have it and you could do an image transfer. So that's probably what I'm gonna have to do when I show you on a tutorial, which I will do to show you the image transfer, but for the decoupage and just to kind of put clarity to 
Do you need to use this? Do you need to use that? For decoupage, you don't. You can use a standard printer you have at home. If you don't have one, maybe a friend has one, a relative, somebody that you know nearby, and they can print the image for you. And you just need a color printer, nothing fancy. And you're just gonna be using a craft glue. I use the Mod Podge. And it does need to go on the front of the image because if you're gonna be applying any more paints, water, anything like that, you've sealed your decoupage to your furniture piece or whatever decorative piece you're using the decoupage for. So I hope that helps in putting clarity to that. And if you have more questions, don't forget, you can leave me comments in the comment box. I'm happy to help just so we can all have understanding what we're doing. And again, I just want you guys to be really successful with your project projects and there's no silly questions. The next question to paint or not to paint. I found that quite interesting. Some people get a little bit confused, like, should I paint this? Shouldn't I paint this? Et cetera, et cetera. And I think what they're concerned about is the actual piece that they're painting. And I'm not a wood expert by any means, but there are some really beautiful old heirloom antiques out there that are in really good condition. And when you're dealing with beautiful oaks and mahoganies and those kind of wood finishes, it's really to your discretion what you feel. And the decor of using beautiful wood furnishings and re-sanding them, maybe even restaining them and bringing the wood back to life, even just with furniture wax. And it's, it's beautiful. So if you feel that the piece with, has that value and you don't want to paint it, then, then don't paint it. There are, I think what a lot of myself, and I can probably speak for a lot of people who are doing decorative finishes with furniture and are creating this is, or creating a business out of it and you know really making a hobby grow into a business is, I think they're trying to, and I am, are trying to demonstrate that there's so many furniture, furniture pieces out there that A, are not real wood, they're MDF, they're, they've got a laminate on it or a veneer on it, and the destruction of the furniture is, it's not even worth the value of the furniture to try to restore it, to, to retrieve the effort and the money and the time to put into restoring it. You're not going to get that value back. So this is where a perfectly good piece of furniture versus a bit of wear and tear on it it's advantageous for you to find a decorative finish like chalk paint, pick the type of finish you'd like to do, whether it's a nice sleek one solid modern look, or perhaps maybe you'd like to do something of an old world finish. And there, I mean, the, it's endless, the type of designs and finishes that you can do and the creativity you could do with the paint to restore a piece of furniture and it is still sellable. So I think people get confused. Should I paint wood? Shouldn't I? That is totally up to you. Just remember, chalk paint does not hurt wood. It, it's never going to hurt the wood. It's a water-based product, number one. It sits on top. It doesn't absorb deep into the wood. So if you decide let's say it's your project, forget the business as aspect of it. It's your project, it's a dark wood finish, it's just kind of daunting looking, it doesn't match your decor, you wanna brighten it up, use chalk paint. If you change your mind five years down the road and you want to go with a uh, lighter stained wood, your decor is different, whatever your story is, not to worry. To removing chalk paint is easy. I've removed chalk paint many times, even just with an orbital sander, comes off, no problem. You're still in the same shoes you are before you paint it. You still need to restore the wood. And that's for you to decide based on the wood it is, what type of finish and color wood you'd like, like stain versus just clear wax, 
you know, are you looking for a pickled look, you know, but where I'm going with this is you are not hurting wood furniture by putting chalk paint on it. And I have lived in a couple of climates where it is so dry and I've seen furniture crack, the wood crack because of the lack of moisture in it, because the air is so dry. If anything, if you can't decide what to do, you, you've decided to go ahead and chalk paint it, you're actually preserving the wood. You're, you're locking in a moisture, you're keeping it there, you're not hurting it, and you can always go back to a wood finish if that's what you choose. So never feel like you'll ever hurt chalk, uh, wood furniture by putting chalk paint finish. I am right in the process, which you guys are gonna see this Saturday, where I had to take latex paint off, and I'm gonna tell you why. It, it is really difficult getting uh, latex paint or oil-based paint off of furniture. And it is messy, it is toxic, it is just a disaster. This is why I hate sanding furniture. And I just, oh, but again, in the tutorial, I'm gonna explain why I had to take it off because unfortunately it's the stigma of why people don't like painted furniture. And this is a good example of why. And I'm hoping that maybe in some light of day, I can change one person's perspective to saying that painting furniture, if it's done properly and with good products, it, it doesn't hurt it. And if anything, it, probably will hopefully help take some of the stigma away of why people don't like it. So, but where I'm going with it is don't feel indecisive. If you're on the fence about what to do, decide what you think is going to be best for your decor. As far as the resale value, it's, it's really one half does the other. You know, it depends on the finish you're going to do. It's going to depend on the era of the piece the market value and the type of wood, but it's really a decision you have to make. But again, just keep in the back of your mind, you're not hurting the wood, you're not. So not to worry, if you decide, then change your mind, you're good to go, you're fine. The other question, which was fantastic, and I think some people are a little bit on the fence sometimes, and I'm hoping this might help you, because you can Google this, is I just wanna show you quickly, a lot of people have a hard time with color pairing. And I am not a color expert by any means. I just try to play and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But to help you when you're feeling indecisive about colors is using a color wheel. And you can Google it, you can write, you know, um, uh, color wheels and they're going to show you all the variances and some of them will direct and I'm going to show you an example and I'm using one of Annie Sloan's books her colorist actually this is a new what they call a bookazine so it's a book magazine mix she's just started these um, I think last year and she's already published I think four of them these are fantastic but getting to the question is a color wheel. And this is a great way to break down your warm tones and your cool tones. So like the cooler colors versus the warmer colors. So I'm just gonna try to bring this up so you can see it really well. And you can see that the color wheel even shows you, like she's broken it all down where you can see graphite, French linen, all on the exterior there, all around the very, very border. And then what she's done there is she's paired it. So you kind of have all of your cool colors and then you have all of your warm colors. So what's kind of fun about the color wheel, I'm just showing you as an example here. So let's take uh, what's a good example here? Um, duck egg blue. That's a pretty familiar color, the duck egg blue. Let's see if I can point that out for you here. So here's your duck egg blue there. And then 
by pairing, you're gonna run it across the wheel and it pairs really nice with en fleur. So again, in the in interior here, into the center, you've got the warm and the cool colors. On the exterior, you have a nice, it's kind of like the neutral tone that pairs really nicely within that color range. So these are really, really helpful when you're trying to decide, oh, I want to use a yellow, I want to use a blue, I want to use green. What's a nice pairing color? And especially when you're wanting to blend with chalk paints. And again, it doesn't matter what paint product you're using. Use what you're happy with, you know, your particular favorite brand that you've been resourcing to or what's accessible for you no matter where you live in the world. This is great. And like I said, you can just go onto your Google search and just type in uh, color wheel and it's going to show you from coloring and then this will help you be able to pair colors. So I generally what I like to do and this is just something I go by. And again, I'm, I'm not saying out of an expertise by any means, but what I like to do is if I'm using a hard color and not when I. I shouldn't even say it like it's a hard color, but a very strong color is actually a better way to say this. Like Amsterdam green. I absolutely love it. It's really rich, like it's emerald green. It's really bold. What I like to use is the taupe, which is in her, um, in the Annie, Annie Sloan uh, color collection is her version of a taupe color is the French linen. So if I'm going to use the uh, Obison blue, or I'm going to use even say Scandinavian pink, the um, Amsterdam green, it's really, these are very, very strong colors. They're beautiful. But I find by putting in a little bit of taupe and I don't have an exact measurement I go by, but when I'm blending paints or I'm making a paint color, I love to add in a little bit of French linen versus adding in a little bit of white. And that's because I'm just wanting to warm it a little bit. I wanna warm that color a little bit. I don't want it to be so strong. I just wanna warm it down just a little bit and you have full control. So let's say you're gonna take half a cup or a cup of paint just add in a tablespoon of, say, a taupe. So again, depending on the, on the colors you're using on the paint products you have, that's what I do, just to bring it down into a warmer tone. The other way you can do it is adding a very strong dark gray or um, uh, like almost a black, but not quite black. Black pigment can really change color, but if you go with a really dark gray, this will help make the color a lot more cool. So it's a great way to play with your colors. So using the dark gray or a taupe, mixing in with those really strong colors. That's what I do when I'm trying to figure out a color formula that I want to use onto a piece. That's kind of where I go all the time. But I really hope that the color will wheel, excuse me, will break it down a little bit. So some people love to use a nice bold contrast color and that's where the color wheel will really help and kind of guide you based on what you're looking for. So if you're wanting to use a blue and you want to use something strong, like blue and orange are beautiful together. And again, this is where that color wheel will help break that down a little bit for you. And this is, again, this is the colorist. That's where I've used the color wheel. And this is a uh, what they call a bookazine uh, magazine and book put together. And any of the stockists carry these books. Um, I don't know if it's carried on Amazon. I'd have to find out. But anyway, these were fantastic questions. I can't thank you guys enough for joining me on the Chalk Paint 101. And I am really looking forward to sharing this Saturday's tutorial as I... I'm almost finished and I've decided to try something I've never done before on any of my Saturday tutorials. If you're new to my channel, my Saturday videos are me actually hands-on doing a decorative finish onto furniture with chalk paints. So definitely check that out. 
Um, don't forget to give me a thumbs up for this video and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I'm really looking forward to next week's Chalk Paint 101 and I love hearing your questions. Please feel free to leave me a comment or any questions that you have based on your chalk paint projects or decorative finishes and I'm going to look forward to seeing you next Wednesday for Chalk Paint 101 episode 4. Take care. Thank you.